Greetings from the Idaho Bluegrass Association. This is Gary Eller speaking from his home in Pickles Butte, Idaho. We have prepared a series of podcasts based on interviews of people with deep roots in Idaho who rose to national prominence or otherwise made a significant impact on bluegrass music in Idaho. This series of podcasts is a collaboration between the Idaho Bluegrass Association, Idaho Songs Project, National Old Time Fiddlers Association, and Utah State University. Well, greetings everybody to the Idaho Bluegrass Association podcast series. Today is the 5th of March 2021, and we are very fortunate to have Idaho's own Rue Frisbee. And Rue, tell us where you are. I was raised here in Emmett, Idaho. That was back in 1944, which puts me at 76 years old today. In a couple of months, I'll be 77. But who's counting, right? (laughs) Yeah, the only reason why I wasn't born in Emmett is because my mother didn't trust any man doctors, and so she had to go over to Caldwell because they had a woman doctor over there, and that's why I was born there instead of here in Emmett. Well, maybe that explains a lot, Rue. Yeah, I guess. Yep, that's the way it was. Pretty much born and raised right here in the Emmett area, and I left for a little while. Right after I got out of high school, I got drafted into the Army and then eventually ended up in the Marine Corps and got busy playing a little music right in between there. And See, my dad was a musician, fantastic musician. He, He played everything, every instrument. You put it in his hands, he could play it. And the reason why that he was a musician was because there was nothing else to do. When he grew up, you know, they they did have a radio, but they didn't have any electricity, so they didn't work. And there was no TV, and so anyway, he just kind of got together with the buddies around in the neighborhood, and everybody had to do something to keep from getting bored to death, so they all played instruments. And that's where he got started. Anyway, after I was about, oh gosh, well, you know, to back up a little bit, my parents divorced when I was about three to six years old. And I had to go stay with my grandparents for a while. And that was a kind of a setback because all my grandparents did was smoke, drink, and cuss. And they also told a lot of very humorous stories sitting around the pot belly stove every day and night and they just passed the stories around and they were very humorous but a little smutty sometimes but that's where I kind of got my start with playing music because my dad played all the time and he quit for about 15 years while I was younger uh, like oh eight to ten years old And then he started picking it up again. He got interested. We started listening to the radio show that was broadcast out of Weezer, Idaho. And he had the Weezer contest there. And KWEI was uh, the radio station. And I remember getting so enthused about listening to the the fiddle players. You know, they, they had such fantastic styles. And one of them I remember... And I got to see the guy actually play. His name was Big Jim DeNoon. He's actually a recording artist. He, he, I've got an old 78 that my grandparents had that we used to play on the old Victrola. It was a wind-up record player. And the dang thing was here. I read on the, the label, and it was, it was Big Jim DeNoon. And when I got to see him in real life, I see why they called him Big Jim DeNoon, because he must have weighed 400 pounds. Uh, He was just absolutely huge. And how he played that violin is beyond me, because his fingers was as big as my wrist. It's an amazing thing. And so anyway, that kind of was one of the things that I remembered when I first went down. There was an impression that I got watching this guy up there on that stage, and he was just like a walking refrigerator. And I remember one thing, when when they said, uh, the MC said, Jim, what are you going to play for us? He said, well, I'm going to play a uh, hornpipe. I kind of catered to these hornpipes. 
I'll play it. Marmaduke's Hornpipe. And boy, he played that thing, and I remembered it note for note, and that's the way I play it today. Things like that kind of stick in your brain, and that's how I got started because I don't read any music. I have to play it by ear, and what somebody will show me or what I hear them do, and I steal it from them. That's kind of the way I've always done things. And so, anyway, that's kind of how I got started. I could talk for an hour about some of the times when I'd go to sleep at night and my dad would have his cronies come over and, and they'd play in the living room and I'd be in the bedroom trying to get some sleep. But that was impossible because they'd play these old fiddle tunes all night long. But my dad played a lot of swing stuff, which I didn't have too much use for until I got a little older. You know, when I was in the Weezer contest, I originally was a guitar player and I played guitar for my little sister, Faye. And my dad, who was mainly a fiddle player, but he also played guitar, and that's how I learned guitar, was from him. But my little sister, that guy just must have been like in the late 50s, when we started going down there and actually competing in the contest, other than just listening and watching. And my little sister Faye, she was sweet on Sam Bush, I tell you what, I've often kicked her because why didn't you get hung up with him? You know where I would have been today? I'd have been down in <laughs> Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I'm on the big stage with Sammy. Two anecdotes to add to that, Rue. One, when I interviewed Sam Bush, one of the first things he asked was, how's Faye doing? You know, I was really sweet on her. <laughs> yeah, they were an item. Yeah, and the second anecdote was, when uh, Chicken Dinner Road was playing back in Kentucky and Tennessee, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, yeah. I remember we were at, at the IBMA, you yelled out of the audience, hey, Sammy. And I remember Sam Bush, without even knowing who he was, he turned around and says, Rui, where are you? <laughs> yeah, he knew exactly where I was coming from. You know, he says, nobody ever called me Sammy except my grandma. <laughs> yeah. But when it came to Weezer, and that was about in the mid to late 50s. Late uh, 60s. He was known as Sammy Bush. I've heard so many great, funny stories from you about playing music. Do you have anything that comes to mind that uh, you might want to share? <laughs> the one that comes to mind is when uh, Sam Bush and all this was sitting out in the in the, uh, the the back uh, behind the uh, the building there where the contest was going on, we were all drinking Cokes, and it was a bottle of Coke. And I was having trouble getting the dang liquid out of my Coke bottle. It was, seemed to be a plug in the thing. You know, I, I tip it up, and I couldn't get any liquid out, but it was full. And all of a sudden, I, I noticed there was something sticking out of the, the neck of the bottle, and I grabbed a hold of it. It was a mouse tail pulled that mouse out, and I thought Sam Bush was going to lose lunch. <laughs> I don't think he ever forgot about that. Well, it, it was funny for everyone else but me. I was the one that was drinking the dang thing. Tell us about interacting with Sam Bush and Byron Berline and Clark Kessinger and Lloyd Wanzer and all those fantastic fiddle players. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was it was some good times we had back then. Everybody knew everybody, and we'd sit around, you know, after the contest and do the jam thing. That, that's been from day one. You know, people say, well, how did this jam thing get started? It started the first day that they had the, the fiddle contest, because when you weren't playing in there on the stage uh, competing, you were out back jamming with the guys. So that, that's kind of the way it was. We used to have a fiddler's breakfast. And, you know, early morning, they, we'd all gather around the little tables outside, and they, it was like a buckaroo breakfast, only it was for the fiddlers. And Big Jim DeNoon was sitting right across the table from uh, Clarence Kimball, Lloyd Wanzer, I think uh, Jim Widner. Yeah, Jimmy Widner was there. And uh, they brought us our, our plate, you know, it had pancakes and sausage and egg or whatever. And Jim DeNoon, it must have been a stack of four or five or six pancakes, big stack of pancakes. And Jim DeNoon, he looked at that and he says, what's this? And the waitress says, well, that's your breakfast. He says, well, i uh, tell you what, honey, why don't you go back and bring me three more just <laughs> like this. <laughs> that guy could eat. Rue, 
I believe you were aware of music before Bill Monroe put together what became the Bluegrass Band in 1947. So you were hearing music before that, and you were around before the fiddle contest started in 1953, and you were there during the greatest heyday, arguably, in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah, so, well, when I first was going to the fiddle contest, that was before it was certified national uh, contest. Uh, all it was was a regional contest. And we didn't start getting the world-renowned fiddlers, you know, like uh, Lloyd Wanza was a local favorite, and he usually won. But then as soon as it was certified, Dale Clark Kessinger came, and there was guys out of Texas. It was coming, Texas Shorty showed up. Oh, there was tremendous Byron Burline. He was just an icon when he showed up on the scene. Just an amazing fiddle player. He brought with him that Texas style that uh, was so exciting to watch and listen to. And uh, everybody started, the locals, we all started converting over to the Texas style because we couldn't compete with it, you know. The, our local style was just like peanuts compared to these guys that that, wow, you know, they started playing. It was, holy smoke, this wasn't just a fiddle tune. This was a, a production. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you told me one time that you never finished out of the top five competing against people like that. Yeah, every year that I entered, I, I either got lucky or, or somebody fouled up, but I always ended up in the top five, which was really a lot of fun, a lot of excitement going on back there because, you know, you're rubbing elbows with some of the best fiddle players in the world. And by gosh, uh, you know, you learn a lot of things when you're when you're around good fiddle players, good musicians. And it was it was a real education for me, you know, musical wise. Well, tell me, who were some of your most influential musical mentors, local or national, fiddle or otherwise, fiddling bluegrass or country music? Who were some of the people that really rang your bell? Well, I tell you what, uh, we mentioned Clark Kessinger. He was an icon that showed up and he brought his you know this was an amazing thing he brought his own guitar player you know <laughs> that was an amazing thing right there he didn't trust any of the local guitar players he brought his own and he brought a guitar player by the name of gene mead and he's long been passed away but he was a fantastic guitar player he had runs that would just blow you away. A tremendous talent on guitar. And I, I'd sit and watch him play guitar, and I got, I was fortunate enough to be in a jam session in Weezer in a basement of the local hotel there, and, and we were passing the tune around. Everybody played a version of it. And Gene Mead was a guitar player, and a, that was a, he was a classic guy to watch. He got so wrapped up and so involved in the music that he was playing, and he was a drooler. You know, he his mouth would, would be open, his tongue was hanging out, and the slobbers were running down off his chin, and he was just playing up a storm. He was a real, real funny guy, but he was tremendously talented. Well, Gene Mead was a very famous North Carolina guitar player, rhythm guitar player is what he's mostly known for, and Clark Kessinger, for the listeners, was a famous West Virginia fiddler in the 20s and 30s, and then he dropped out of music, and it was rediscovered during the folk revolution in the 50s and 60s, and came out of retirement. And he wrote a song for his wife, it was called Rose of My Heart. I'll have to play it for you sometime. Yeah, I still hear that on the Bluegrass radio station now and then. It's a really beautiful song. But Clark was really an old-time fiddler, wasn't he? He wasn't a swing fiddler. He had his own style. He was very accomplished. He could do double, double, uh, double bowing. He could do triple bowing. He did a lot of things that went way beyond almost all of us there at the contest. He, we, we all just kind of stood back and took notes. Yeah, <laughs> and a great entertainer. Yes, he was. Yes, yeah. he was. He was. He was there not only just to play the tune, but he was there to to please the crowd. Ruth Risby was heavily influenced 
by many old time fiddlers who were around Weezer in the 1950s and the 1960s before the contest style veered towards Texas style polished fiddling. No person had a bigger impact than Otis Howard, who was one of the last of the true old time Idaho fiddlers and also one of the last of the horse drawn freighters. The 1968 Fiddle Contest LP recording contains Rue's rendition of Otis Howard Schottish. This also appears in an Idaho Songs project featuring the life of Dave Frisbee and Otis Howard and over 30 old time fiddle tracks on the project Idaho Old Time Fiddle, published in 2009. Let's hear Rue play Otis Howard Schottish in the 1968 Fiddle Contest. into the 80s now. I've been talking to people that you know well, played music with in the Treasure Valley, when the bluegrass scene was really phenomenal here. Great players, many of whom went on to do things nationally. And you were right in the middle of all that, the lock, stock, and barrel scene. Yeah, I was just kind of touring around with a country western group. This would have been probably late 50s, early 60s. And I was just playing country western backup fiddle and guitar, and then I saw an ad in the local newspaper, if you're interested in bluegrass music, call this number. And so I called that number, and they said, we're going to have a jam session over to my place, that would be in Boise. And Milt Johnson was the guy that put the, uh, the ad in there, and I went over there not knowing what to expect. And uh, my gosh, I just loved uh, playing that kind of music, you know, and uh, some Bill Monroe type stuff, and uh, they got with some different type of pickers, and by gosh, it just snowballed from right there. Ragged but right, the uh, local band out of Boise was playing at the Lock, Sock, and Barrel every other Sunday. They were scheduled to play every Sunday, but there was just a little too much for them, so they called our group, which was uh, too far gone. And they said, would you guys like to play every other Sunday, you know, trade off with us? I said, yeah, you bet, we'll do it. So we ended up trading off every other Sunday with them, with Ragged But Right. And of course, when Doug Jenkins, uh, he was a fiddle player there for Ragged, or for, uh, for yeah, Ragged But Right. But every time the steelhead run came up in North Idaho, he didn't play fiddle anymore. He was up to fiddle. So I got drafted to play it over with the, with the Ragged But Right, and it, which didn't hurt my feelings a bit. They were, they were a lot of fun to play with, too. Well, that was quite a run, 17 years at one place yeah. every other week. So what was the audience like? It was close, tight, very responsive. And, you know, they were there. They knew what was going to happen when they got there, and, and they were prepared for it. And, my gosh, it was just, uh, you know, they, there was a lot of, of uh, people there that knew a lot about bluegrass, and they knew what to request. And it was just a very inspiring time. You know, it, it was one of those things when you get done with the gig and you go home, but you can't sleep because you're rewinding the whole thing through your head again. <laughs> Well, is it fair to say that you were mostly a bluegrass player after that? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it was just, that's all I ever do anymore. And that's after that uh, 17 years playing the bluegrass there at the Lock, Sock, and Barrel, that's pretty much all I was interested in. So let's go into the 90s and then the, the 2000s and talk about what you were doing. The group that I was with was, was 
tearing or tearing down, and they, they didn't want to play anymore. So the Buckhorn Mountain Boys. Yeah, the Buckhorn Mountain Boys is who I was playing with then, but that was was uh, disbanding, and so you know we were all looking for a job, and of course Chicken Deer Road heard about it, and they needed a fiddle player really bad because they had just lost their gal. And so they came and listened to us, and that was our our last gig that we played. Rue Frisbee was the fiddle player for the Buckhorn Mountain Boys from 2002 until the band disbanded in 2012, when the band leader Al Jackson returned to Oregon. During that period, the Buckhorns were certainly one of the preeminent bluegrass bands in Idaho. Let's listen next to an instrumental written by Mike Bond that appears on their CD, One More River, entitled The Buckhorn Mountain Breakdown. Fantastic experiences together over the last 10, 12 years in Chicken Dinner Road, haven't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it got its ups and it's got its downs, but it's always fun. I'll ask you a couple questions I've been asking everybody. Do you have any suggestions on how the Idaho Bluegrass Association can encourage more young people to play Americans' Roots music? Well, i tell you what, where I came from and where my... Roots came from from my dad who played, and the reason why he played was because they didn't have any television, they didn't have any radio, they didn't have anything other than just playing music for entertainment. See, right now, it's everybody's got a cell phone, everybody's got a computer, everybody's got a TV going, and it's pretty hard to compete for entertainment when you've got all of those things going on. And how can I teach someone how to play old-time fiddle or bluegrass music when they've got this other stuff that interferes and it appears to be a lot more entertaining than what, than what I'm trying to teach? You know, that's why it's not near as popular today as it was 50, 60 years ago. Well, how do we reach out to a few of those kids? Boy, I don't know. I've tried, and I, I get a, a little interest going, but then they get married and move off. They find other things that are more exciting than what I'm teaching them. Life is just faster now, isn't it? it, it, it it's a different lane yeah. altogether. All right. Well, Rua, we really appreciate you sharing some history of your musical adventures. And let's see if you have any final comments you want to throw in before we finish up the interview today. One thing I've found that playing a musical instrument is not like riding a bicycle. You have to keep it up. If you put that thing down, it forgets who you are. Your muscles don't remember what to do. 
it's a athletic ability as well as a mental capacity that you have to have at the same time. And especially like on guitar and, and then fiddle, you've got to keep active with it. Don't just put it in the case. It'll forget who you are. And so that, that my advice is if you can play an instrument, you better keep playing it as long as you can because old arthritis will call, call you up and pretty quick you can't play anymore. So enjoy it while you can. Well, I'm not too far behind you in years, Rue, and I intend to play a banjo or guitar every day as long as I can. Yep, you better, because if you like doing it, if you quit, you won't be doing it again, because it'll forget you. Well, thank you, Rue. We really appreciate it. Rue Frisbee, lifelong resident of Emmett, Idaho. They're on Frozen Dog Road.